This morning we're continuing in John's Gospel, jumping ahead again into John chapter 7. We're just going to be looking at, or reading three verses, but looking really at, well, all three of them, but mainly the first two, and saving the third verse for this evening, which will have more to do with what happens on the day of Pentecost when Jesus is glorified and he pours out his Holy Spirit. What difference does that really make? This morning, though, we're going to be looking at the invitation he issues at the end of the feast. If anyone is thirsty, to come to him and drink. So let me read for you these uh, few verses, verses 37 through 39 of John chapter 7. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, you know, it's funny, um, we've, we're only two weeks into the month of November, and, and I'm hoping that we're still thinking about what it is we were looking at during the month of October when we had the opportunity to look again at that great honor that the Lord actually gives us in his kingdom, and that is that we might be his ambassadors, that we might go to others as his representatives to tell them how they can be reconciled with God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, we saw during that month how it is we are to do this. And it's just by sharing with them that simple message of the gospel, which can be summarized uh, very, very succinctly. Acts 16, verse 31. Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. He went on to say that if your family believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they too will be saved. So we share that simple message of the gospel with them. We saw that if they respond in faith and repentance, that we are to bring them into the fellowship of the church and we are to disciple them and teach them to know Jesus, to worship Jesus, to give their lives to him and how they are to live in such a way that they may please him. We saw that we are to be ready at all times and in all places to share this message because if we're not ready, we're going to miss or we may miss one of those precious opportunities that the Lord gives to us. Perhaps the only one that we're going to have with that particular individual and maybe the only opportunity they're ever going to have to hear about God's love for sinners and his willingness to be reconciled to them through his Son. And we saw, of course, that very important point where the power comes from to be able to do what it is the Lord calls us to do because we know it doesn't come from us. We are never going to find within ourselves the resources, the power that we need to reach out to others with the gospel, at least in the way that we need to do it because that power comes from the Holy Spirit. By the way, that power has been given. The day of Pentecost is past. Jesus has been glorified. He has poured out of his Holy Spirit. So this power is available to us now. That's what we're going to want to explore, Lord willing, a bit more this evening. But this morning, I think we need to see something else in our text, something that we need to be aware of as we evangelize, something that Jesus has already told us, and something that John seems to emphasize perhaps more than the other gospel writers, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing men, women, and children to himself. This is something that is beyond the power of anyone to do. They need the work of the Spirit. Well, we see now the Feast of Booze is coming to a close. Jesus has been at the feast uh, as we've seen, he went up secretly and not openly so that he wouldn't be killed along the road. 
But it wasn't because he was afraid. We see that once he got to the, uh, the feast, he wasn't afraid to speak publicly. He went up to the temple and he was teaching publicly. He was performing signs, miracles that proved that he was from God. And there were many there who saw those things and they realized that, that even if, if, if there were another Messiah, he certainly couldn't do more than this man is doing. This must be the Messiah. Many were beginning to believe. And of course, they were confused because... The leaders weren't doing anything about it, and it looked like maybe they were beginning to believe, but we understand that there were many who still hated Jesus and who wanted to kill him. Now, in our particular text, we see on the last day Jesus stands. This is the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast. After this day, the feast is over and everybody's going to go their own way. And realizing that the people are about to leave and go back to their homes, realizing that this may be the last time that they have the opportunity to see him or hear him, Jesus gives a gospel invitation. If anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Now what I'd like to do is consider three things from this. The first is, why does Jesus again use this illustration of water, thirst, river? Uh, What is it that Jesus is actually saying in this text or in this invitation? And then thirdly, what is it that must be true of you before you can receive what it is that Jesus is offering? Well, first of all, let's consider why he gives the invitation, as he does at this feast. Now, we've already looked a little bit at this feast, and let me just tell you by way of reminder that the Lord originally instituted the Feast of Tabernacles to remind his people of two things. The first is of how he took care of their fathers when they wandered for many years in the wilderness after he had brought them out of Egypt. Remember that it it took a while to get to the Promised Land, and then when they sent the spies into the Promised Land, ten of the spies didn't have any faith. They didn't believe that God could give them the land, and so they encouraged the people to go back to Egypt. And when that happened, because the people listened to these ten spies rather than to the two faithful spies who said, if God wants to give us this land, he certainly can do it. We just simply need to trust him. God condemned them to live for 40 years in the wilderness until all the men of war had died out. But during all this time in the wilderness, God provided for his people And God wanted them to remember that. And how he graciously fulfilled his promise to bring them into the land as he originally told them that he would. As he swore by oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a land that was blessed with fruitfulness. Well, they were in the land. God had fulfilled the promise. God wanted them to remember. And to make it more memorable... The Lord had them live during the, uh, these eight days of the feast in makeshift tabernacles or booths or what we would call, if we saw them, lean-tos or some type of primitive tents. He wanted them to remember the time that he took care of their fathers in the wilderness. By the way, the Feast of Booths is not something we celebrate today, but it can have a purpose also for us because it gives us a striking illustration of what our lives are really like in this world. Our bodies are not permanent. They are like tents. They wear out. They get old. And eventually, they're going to be torn down. We are living in lean-tos. We're living in tents. And they're only meant for a very brief period of time before we move on to our permanent homes in heaven. You know, we're all going to leave this world perhaps sooner than we think. And the question our text is asking us this morning is, are you ready? Have you come to Jesus? Have you drunk of that water that he has to give? Now, the Jews lived in these lean-tos for seven days and perhaps on the eighth day as well. But on the eighth day, we are told there was a Sabbath and a special convocation. In other words, there was a day of rest and there was a gathering of God's people together for worship. We read in Leviticus 23, 36, in the institution of this feast, on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly, which is what convocation means. 
You shall do no laborious work. There's the rest. There's the Sabbath. Now, it's interesting that during these several days of the feast that, that there were several sacrifices which were made on each day. On the first day, they offered 13 bullocks as well as assorted uh, other animals. And as far as the other animals were concerned, they were the same for each day. But each successive day of the feast, they would offer one less bullock until on the seventh day, they offered seven of them for a total of 70. Now, according to the tradition of the Jews, these bullocks, these 70 bullocks, were to represent the 70 nations of the world. And they were offered to make atonement for the nations. This is something which is interesting because I didn't think the Jews really had that much concern for what was going on in the other nations, but they were. They realized, though, that these nations would have to come to them for salvation. They knew that God had promised Gentile salvation, but in those days they had to come to them. But they offered these bullocks to make atonement for the nations so that God might be gracious to them and that he might provide for them. But on the eighth day, there was only one bullock that was offered. And this the Jews understood to be for their own nation. One bullock for each of the 70 nations on the other days, but the eighth day we are offering this bullock for our own. And this is what made it special. Now, they later included two other ceremonies that would become a part of this feast. They would light lamps at night in the temple to remember how the Lord had graciously led them through the wilderness by a pillar of fire at night. And then they also drew water from the pool of Siloam, the same pool that Jesus would later send the blind man to wash the clay off of his eyes, and after he washed, he would see they would take water from this pool and they would pour it out on the altar to remind them of how the Lord provided water from the rock at Sinai. John Gill in his commentary writes this, and this ceremony they say is a tradition of Moses from Mount Sinai and refers to some secret and mysterious things. Yea, they plainly say that it has respect to the pouring forth of the Holy Ghost. Interestingly, that's exactly what it means. And as the water was poured out, they would sing from Isaiah 12, verse 3. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Now, I want you to notice that it was on this last day this last day of the feast, this great day, presumably as the water is being poured out on the altar, that Jesus stood and he gives this invitation. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This is a gospel invitation. And it's given because of the water being poured out on the altar because that water represents the gift which our Lord Jesus Christ has to give and which he will give to everyone who comes to him. And that brings us to the second point, what Jesus was actually saying. I mean, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying much the same thing that he said to the woman at the well of Samaria in John 4, verses 13 and 14. Everyone who drinks of this water, that is the water in the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now Jesus here is saying that he is the only one who can save you. If you knew who I was, you would ask of me, I would give you this water. And the spirit that he has to give is the only one who can really satisfy you. John writes in verse 39 of, of John chapter 7, But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I think you understand that water is often used in Scripture as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, likely because the Spirit of God not only has the ability uh, to, to create thirst, but also to quench 
thirst, the thirst he creates for spiritual things. And really this lesson that was being displayed at the Feast of Booze and the pouring out of this water was meant to teach them that it's only through the work that Jesus Christ did that you can receive this spirit. Now I already mentioned to you that this ceremonial pouring out of the water on the last day of the feast that the Jews understood as a symbol of the future outpouring of the Holy Spirit came from that time that they were in the wilderness wandering when the Lord provided water from the rock. You know, it's, it's interesting how in the Old Testament the Lord gives these uh, visible object lessons that are meant to prefigure the work of Jesus to show them ahead of time what it is that Jesus was going to do. You know, this, this, wa- this instance of the water from the rock, the Lord had intended uh, to teach them this very lesson. Let's read about it in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock. And water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And when he did, water came from the rock. And the Lord quenched the thirst of his people. I want you to notice certain things about this particular passage. First of all, the Lord said that he was going to stand before Moses. That is, that he was going to stand before him on the rock. Okay, the pre-incarnate Son of God, I believe this is our Lord Jesus Christ before he becomes a man. The shepherd of God's people who would later become a man stands on the rock. And then he commands Moses to strike it. So that when Moses struck the rock, by the way, with the rod of God's judgment. Remember, that staff he had was called the rod of God's judgment. It was the staff he used to strike the Nile, turning the water into blood. That rod of judgment would pass through the Lord who was standing on the rock, in a certain sense, striking him. And when Moses would strike the rock, water would gush out to provide for his people. Now, I think, again, this was an object lesson. The Lord was showing his people ahead of time of what he was going to do in order to save them. When the rod of God's judgment would fall upon Jesus Christ on the cross, he would open a floodgate of grace and make the way for the Spirit to be poured out upon his people. Uh, One thing that's interesting about this rock is that the Lord taught them through the rock that Jesus was only going to be struck one time, that he only had to lay down his life once, he only had to die once. Because the next time the Lord provided water from the rock, he told Moses to speak to the rock rather than to strike the rock in Numbers 20, verse 8. He says, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. Now sadly on this occasion because Moses was already angry at the people for their murmuring and complaining and crying out against the Lord instead of speaking to the rock he struck it again and for his sin he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. But what is it that the Lord actually intended through that illustration? Well, now that Jesus has been struck, now that he has died and rose again from the dead, all you need to do is ask. 
As Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John 4, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You don't have to strike the rock. Jesus doesn't need to be struck again. He doesn't have to be offered often as some historic Christian denominations believe that he is. He was offered once for all. All you need to do now is simply speak, simply ask, and the Lord will give you this living water. Now, just so you understand that this isn't some kind of you know, elaborate, imaginative interpretation, we do need to realize that Paul interprets the rock in the wilderness in exactly this way when he says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual drink, uh, food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Now obviously not the literal rock was Christ but that rock was a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was struck that he might give his water to his people, the one who was to be spoken to that he might again give this water that would sustain their lives physically as a symbol of the water that he would give that would make them live spiritually and satisfy them spiritually. Jesus is simply saying through this invitation, if you want that which alone can satisfy, can satisfy your deepest needs, your deepest longings, and keep you fully satisfied, then you must come to him and ask. Now finally, and back to our original point of, of how this adds to our evangelism, what is it that has to be true of those who, whom you speak to before they can receive what it is that Jesus offers here? What must be true of you before you will receive it? Well, Again, Jesus told us in verse 37, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Jesus says there's a prerequisite here. If you want to come to him and drink, you must, first of all, be thirsty. You know, there's an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Now, why can't you make him drink? Well, it's because if he isn't thirsty... He's not going to be interested in the water. If you're already satisfied with what you have, you won't want any more or anything different because you're already content. Now the same thing is true with regard to the gospel. You can lead someone to Jesus Christ. You can share that message with them, the simple message of what Jesus has done to save sinners. You can tell them that they need to trust him that they need to turn away from their sins, that they need to follow him, but they're not going to do it unless they want to, unless they're thirsty, unless they feel their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is this something that you can give them? Can you make them thirsty? Well, not really. It really is the work of the Holy Spirit. And again, that's that element that I told you at the beginning that John seems to focus on in the ministry of Jesus Christ that isn't focused on as much in the other Gospels. You can't give them this thirst, but the Spirit of God can. But now here's another point. How is he going to do it? Well, he's going to do it through you and through me in, in many ways because the Spirit of God uses a variety of things to create this thirst. One of the things he uses is apologetics. Sometimes he works through arguments. You know, we have so much evolution, evolutionary science, evolutionary thought that's just woven through our society and people take it for granted that we are just a great cosmic accident. We don't really need God to explain us. And yet as we look at the evidence more carefully and we build arguments from that evidence, we can use apologetics to get people to think about what it is they believe, to challenge them and to make them uncomfortable, to give them some concern that perhaps what the Bible says really is true and evolution doesn't excuse me 
Maybe I really am going to have to stand before God. Sometimes the Spirit of God works through the law of God to make people uncomfortable, to convict them of their sin. Sometimes He works through conscience to make them afraid because they know that one day they're going to have to give an account of their lives. You know, sometimes the Spirit of God creates this thirst by, by uh, through, well, I should say, through the promises of the gospel. You know, some people respond to fear. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards found that. He said to be the most useful thing in, in converting people and getting them to wake up and get concerned about their souls is the fact that there's a fiery hell that they might have to go into. But there are other people who respond to a description of heaven as it were filled with love. God even works through that particularly through that revelation of his infinite love through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to create a thirst because he's already brought them to the point where they recognize that the love that's available in this world is not fulfilling. Maybe they haven't had much of it. Maybe they've been beat up their whole lives. Maybe they feel like the off-scouring of society, maybe like the Samaritan woman. And when they're... Uh, confronted with God's love and this invitation, then they, you know, the Spirit of God works through that to create this thirst. These are just some of the things He uses to awaken those who are without Christ to their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so anything that you can share with others of these things can be useful to move them in the right direction. But let's not forget the way the Spirit of God works most powerfully to create this thirst is through the gospel itself. What Jesus did to save sinners. The invitation to come to him. I mean, you can argue back and forth for hours using apologetics, but until you actually issue the invitation of the gospel, sometimes the Spirit of God will not work or create that thirst until then because that is what he makes powerful to save. The call to faith and repentance. This is the message he uses that creates the kind of thirst that will bring someone to Jesus Christ. These other things might awaken them, might make them concerned at some level, but it's the gospel he uses to create that thirst that will bring them to Jesus Christ. So make sure that whatever else you do when you're interacting with other people, when you're trying to evangelize them, that you tell them the gospel The Spirit's going to do the rest. He's going to create the thirst when and where He wills. But we need to understand He will do it, not in everyone, but He will do it at least in some. When our Lord Jesus Christ stood up at the feast and He issued this invitation, He knew that Israel wasn't going to immediately flock to Him, that all of them were going to come. He he knew that wasn't going to happen, but He knew that some would He knew there were those his father had given to him. And when you share the gospel, you can know as well that some are going to respond. There are going to be some who will come, some that the father has given to his son. Now finally, as I said before, if you're going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to have this thirst. But what about those of you who are here this morning who haven't come to Christ, even though you've heard the gospel over and over? Why haven't you come to Jesus Christ? Well, it's because you don't want to come to Jesus, because you aren't thirsty for Jesus, because you found something else that meets that need, or at least you think you found something else that meets it. You know, God and his angels, Jesus Christ, his people, his kingdom isn't the only thing that exists in this world. There's another kingdom as well. And that other kingdom has a God. At least it's the God of this world. We know it's a lowercase God. He's nothing compared to the infinite and eternal God. He's no comparison. They are not equal forces that are opposing one another. God is infinite. Lucifer, the devil, is finite. God can sweep him away with infinite ease. But we do know that the true God has allowed Satan a good measure of authority over this world. And the God of this world keeps the people of this world satisfied with the things of this world. He keeps them happy and he keeps them content. And as long as he does, 
they won't come to Jesus Christ. As long as he keeps you, who don't know Jesus Christ, satisfied with the things that he has to provide, you're not going to come to Jesus Christ either. Now just remember this. Whatever it is that you think is satisfying to you from this world, or whatever it may be in the future, it can never ultimately satisfy you because it's limited. The fun wears off, and you soon move on to something else. I mean, just look at your own experience. I mean, have you ever had that experience in life where you, you thought, if I, if I can just have that car, if I can just have that relationship, if I can just have that job, if I can just have you know, any of a myriad of things, if I can just have that, I'll be satisfied, I'll be happy, it's all I need. And then maybe you get that thing and maybe you have that happiness and satisfaction for a little while, but then after a while it wears off and you look for something else to fill in the gap, uh, to satisfy that need. Well, that's the way the things of the world are, they're limited. They can only give you so much happiness, so much joy, and after the fun wears off, you begin looking for something else. It will never fully satisfy you. But you see, <clears throat> the satisfaction that Jesus gives will never grow old. You'll never get tired of it. He will satisfy you from now until the end of time, and He can do that because He is unlimited. Everything in this world is limited, but He is infinite and the joy and the happiness and the pleasure that he gives is something that will never wear off which is what he means when he says that if you come to him and drink from your innermost being will flow rivers of living water in other words this continual satisfaction as Jesus told the woman at the well of Samaria if you drink from this water you will never thirst again if you drink of that well you drink of that physical water, you will thirst again. Just as when you drink from the things that this world has to give, you will thirst again because they can't satisfy. But if you come to me and drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. But you will have within yourself a well of water springing up into eternal life. Jesus is the only one who ultimately can satisfy. And let me just remind you of one other thing. If you continue to fill your life with the things of the world, they're not going to help you on that day that you're going to need help more than any other day of your life, and that is on the day of God's judgment. These things will be a poor substitute for Jesus Christ on the day that you will stand before God because the only thing that's going to help you on that day is Jesus. He's the only one who can take away your sin and your guilt. He's the only one who can give you that perfect righteousness. He can clothe your nakedness with the robes of his righteousness and make you acceptable to God. He's the only one by trusting in him that can get you into heaven. These things of the world aren't going to do you any good. If they're found in your hands on the day of judgment, they're going to weigh you down into hell. But if you're trusting Jesus Christ, he will welcome you into heaven. Now, if the Lord has shown you that this is true this morning, if he has created within you this thirst by his Holy Spirit, then come to Jesus. Take hold of him by faith. Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to him and drink. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit. Let him satisfy your thirst. And know that if you do, Jesus Christ will keep you safe. He's not only going to watch over you in this life and bring you safely to that day of judgment, but he will keep you safe when it matters most of all, and that is on the day of judgment. If you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't found in him your full satisfaction, if you're still thirsty for the things of the world, come to Jesus Christ and find that satisfaction, find that fulfillment because it is only in Him. It's only by believing in Him, trusting Him, turning from your sins and following Him. May the Lord grant that we would all do so this morning. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer.